I want to go to an expert. Someone who's been a chief economist with the World Bank, someone who's been a former chief economic advisor with the government of India and possibly one of India's best known economists, Kaushik Basu. Dr. Basu, thank you very much for joining me. You know, the minister has spoken. I want to ask you now as a professional economist, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the economy? Or should I put it this way, what is Kaushik Basu's prescription for start reviving the economy? Where should one start, sir? Rajdeep, uh, thank you very much um, uh, for giving me the opportunity. Um, th the most important thing right now, things were going pretty well till a couple of weeks ago, till about a month ago. Since then, a variety of indicators are showing that India is beginning to trail. Mm -hmm. And I feel it is anxiety about the exit from the lockdown which is making markets capital and i've got a variety of indicators mm -hmm. begin to move out of india to other countries and that is really the crucial step that india has to take the unwinding from the lockdown it has to be quick everything cannot be taken off there will be many dimensions on which the lockdown will continue but you want a variety of dimensions on which the lockdown to be taken off very quickly so that workers are able to go to factories managers are able to go to their workspace where they begin to work. You need to do this because there are other countries that are beginning to do this, and that's what's happening on the global markets. The global markets are sensing this risk in India that it can become more controlled. So that's the short take. There are many things to elaborate. Let's elaborate them. You know, where would you start? You know, the question is, you've seen what the government has done with red, green, and orange zones. Would you therefore start by easing the lockdown at the district level first, at the regional level, decentralize it rather than make it Delhi-centric. Where do you start the exit strategy that you're talking about with a sense of urgency? How do you restore supply lines? Because if you don't do it, and if you don't have free movement of men and material, how do you achieve an exit plan? Absolutely. So two areas where for another month, you have to continue with restrictions. One is school openings. Mm -hmm. You have to keep it on hold for another month. Uh, gathering in one place, you have to have restrictions. More than a certain number of people can get together in one place. But beyond that, mm -hmm. you want to begin to open up by allowing the movement of people, which means transportation has to start. And this is starting all over the world, and people are giving dates. The red zones have to be very, very small zones. You can't have a whole district locked up yes. because the supply chains go through districts. And having many of those locked up will mean that the supply chains will not open up. Very important. You have to create space for the small firms, the informal sector, but also for the big corporations. You have to understand that in India, it's all linked and linked in ways which are so complicated that you cannot sit in a bureaucratic office and work out that this is the way I'll open up. You have to just create the space. So very narrow red zones, which should not be full districts, but tiny areas, and you allow the rest of the economy to open up quite rapidly mm -hmm. with rules in place. Social distancing will have to continue. Masks will have to continue. Right. Rajdeep, can I also point out one thing which I'm sensing in India? There is a fear psychosis disproportionate. If you look at the deaths being caused by COVID mm -hmm. and corrected for population size, the differences between India, South Asia, Africa, on the one hand, and Europe and North America is just huge. Whereas we are playing by the same kind of rules that they are doing a lockdown and we will go one step further, not realizing that in India, out of every 10 million people, the death rate from COVID is eight. Even if that is being understated, let us say it's being understated by half. So instead of eight, it is double the number dying by COVID, it's 16. Mm -hmm. Do you know what's the number for Spain for every 10 million people? Mm -hmm. It's 5,250. So if, even if India's eight becomes 16, it's nowhere near not what's happening in Spain, Italy, UK, and even Germany. Germany, the figure is 790. The Indian figure is eight. Make the eight 16, we are nowhere near. We have to act, but we must not get into the folly which is the risk now because still one month ago two months ago on a variety of indicators india was really ready to take off once the pandemic ended all those indicators and i can give you some of those indicator numbers if you want mm -hmm. are beginning to change so the 
thing to do now is to look at other countries. All of them are giving clear signals that they will allow markets to function. European countries, of course, but we've got also Asian countries. We, we are giving, uh, giving that signal. So a lot of the capital and markets are beginning to move out of India to these other spaces, which will be less controlled. And we know from history that a controlled economy backfires almost invariably. We must not fall into that trap. You know, you're, what you're saying is very important. You're saying the longer this lockdown continues, we remain a controlled economy while other countries are beginning to open up. Now, Dr. Basu, former finance minister Chidambaram has suggested that we must first start by providing for those at the bottom of the pyramid, two big financial packages, one lakh crores wage assistance to the poor, especially those working in the informal sector and MSMEs and loan assistance to those MSMEs. Do you agree that massive packages are necessary in a way to try and ensure that the economy has is picked up from bottom up rather than top down that is one step not at, not enough so mm. i think steps like this and these kinds of numbers much bigger than what we are doing are essential for the poor to give cash support and food support and health support is critical and we have to do much more not 1% of GDP, but maybe 2%, 3% of GDP. And I think India has fiscal space to do this. But that is not enough. The big mistake which we've seen through history in controlled economies, you think you support a whole segment of the population, you control businesses all over elsewhere. You cannot do it. You have to create space for factories to open up, for people to move. There will be some risks even if the COVID fatality goes up a little bit, and there is that risk, mm -hmm. we have to allow for that. Another thing which epidemiologists are pointing out, and we don't hear enough voices within India, that this can go on for six months. So it's possible that India's COVID will pick up from October, November, when the winter sets in. We cannot be in a lockdown position more than any other country is doing for seven, eight months in a lockdown position. So if it opens up, the numbers begin to flare up later, you right. begin to act later. Right now, Chidambaram is right. You do want to put in a big package. Raghuram Rajan has been talking about it. You want to put in a big package. But you also have to let the control go because the, if the big corporations are strangled, even if you give money to MSMEs, they will not have business. And if you continue to give support to the MSMEs, at some point, the fiscal limits will kick in. You know, very interesting the way you're putting it. Controlled economy takes us almost back to the license permit, Raj, as you put it. But the question many people are asking is that where do we get resources for these major packages? You, the minister says the US can do it, Japan can do it. Where, how does India do it? GST collection is down, tax revenues are down. How do you then put money in the system when you don't have adequate resources? Yeah. Uh, revenues are short, but... India has a very sophisticated FRBM Act, mm -hmm. which puts restrictions on how much of a fiscal deficit we can run up. Mm -hmm. But if you look at that law, this is a 2003 Act, and really one of the best uh, laws in the world in terms of uh, fiscal restrictions. But there are exceptions there. If there is a natural calamity, if there is a national security issue, you can lift these up and begin to spend. India's debt to GDP ratio is 68%. 68% is less than in many European countries. So 68% is a reasonable debt to GDP ratio. In a crisis, you can easily go up to 75, 80, which means you're borrowing money in order mm -hmm. to inject money into these sectors. One thing, Razdeep, I should say, which is concerning me a little bit, the Indian bureaucracy, and I worked for four years with the Indian bureaucracy. It's a bunch of very smart people. There are one or two awful people who just want to control. But by and large, the top bureaucracy is a bunch of very smart people, very well-meaning people. They want to help the country. Where are their voices? These kinds of details mm -hmm. on the fiscal details opening up of, from the lockdown, you need intricate thinking, which I know the Indian bureaucracy, having worked with it, is capable of, and they are smart enough to do that. We are not hearing that voice, which is very, very unfortunate, as these global indicators and this is only happening over the last month, are showing that India's position rank-wise is dropping. Let me give you one number. The drop in exports, people will say it's happening all over the world. In March, India's exports dropped by 35%. China's exports dropped by 7%. Mm -hmm. So it's dropping everywhere. India's is dropping 
more. Emerging Markets Tracker. Emerging Markets Tracker had India as the number two position. India has now dropped down with only two countries behind India. Thailand is ahead of India. Um, uh, Malaysia is ahead of India. Vietnam. China, which was behind India, is ahead of India. All this is happening over the last month because we are not giving signals of the opening up well enough. That's right. And Vietnam is seen as the big success story at the moment. Now, in a recent article picking up from what you said, this return to license permit, Raj, are you therefore saying the longer we continue with this lockdown, the more it will lead to an over-bureaucratization of the economy? And that is something you fear, that this is the moment in a way to unshackle rather than shackle. Absolutely. There are some rules which are special to the COVID which will be there. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, you won't want to unshackle. I mean, in Bombay, you have rules like two people in a car will be allowed. I, I don't quite understand if from a household where four people are staying together, if four of them who are in a room in a household get into a car in a household, why have that additional rule for them? So bring the rules down minimally. Trains open up trains with lots of special rules you will have to have there about how many people can sit in a compartment, etc. But beyond that, don't strangle because India has a history of license permit Raj. We are prone to that. And the world has examples from around, you know, China 1978. It was if Deng Xiaoping did not have the wisdom to realize that the over control from the top, you need to remove China would not be the economic boom story that it became subsequently. It happened because Deng Xiaoping decided that some of the powers that were there in the government, it's worth giving up those powers. We must not go in the opposite direction. Do you see, but therefore, light at the end of this dark tunnel? Or do we simply live now with a slowing Indian and global economy for the next few years? Do you really see opportunity for, the, for, uh, for India at the moment? Or do we really, do you believe we have the stamina or we must have the stamina to ride this out? No, I feel actually we have to have the stamina to ride this out. But I do see light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, India, Till about two months ago, yes, there were uh, the growth had slowed down, but there was global optimism on India, and I was optimistic about India's growth till a couple of weeks ago. But last few weeks, watching the exit, I'm worried. Here are two areas where there is a lot of light at the end of the tunnel. If we play our cards right over the next month, month and a half, and it's not a big window, mm -hmm. two sectors that I think are going to boom in the long run: the health sector is going to become huge globally. Healthcare, we will be buying more healthcare than luxury cars and homes. We will be buying longer longevity. India had a lot of initial strength in this sector. We are not very good at providing healthcare to a lot of our population, which is shameful. But we have a corporate sector here which can step into this. Mm -hmm. So India has a potential there. Now, outsourcing business processes, outsourcing information technology. India was one of the global leaders. Our space is shrinking because we are too locked down. But once it opens up, unless we have already conceded ground, Philippines has taken away most of our business. It's moved to South Africa. Mm -hmm. If we have not conceded that space, then we can begin to do these two big sectors, which I think will be booming sectors. India has a big scope over there. So on the whole, I remain optimistic that we will, over the next months, take the right steps and step into the opportunity that is going to come after this pandemic situation is behind us. You know, Dr. Basu, you're reflecting quite brilliantly, I think, the dilemma that faces the world, which is lives versus livelihoods. Countries are hesitant, as you will acknowledge at times, to open up because they fear that if you open up, what happens to the health concerns, the number of corona cases could rise. There are others who are saying, as you might be, that the longer the lockdown continues, it becomes worse for the economy. There will be a job crisis, and that's almost as bad as losing lives. Where do you exactly stand then on this lives versus livelihoods debate? Is that the right way to pitch this debate? You know, the way this has been pitched, and I have to say this is coming a lot from big advanced economies, and India and a whole lot of African countries also are getting misled by this, the lives, of course, lives are extremely important, but the numbers I just gave you, it is about 800 times worse, the life risk in a whole host of European countries, 500 to 800 times worse than in India. Germany, which has done very, very well in Europe, 
it's a hundred times worse in Germany compared to India. So yes, lives are important. But if you, with the life situation so much better in India, in South Asia and Africa, if you continue to play the card actually in attention away from the economy, then you're playing this balance between lives and livelihoods wrong. Mm. And we are seeing that in European countries where the life situation is much worse, they are opening up the economy much more. So yes, that trade-off is important, but look at the numbers. We must not imitate other countries and do exactly what they are doing because the numbers are very, very different in India. And there is speculation as to why that is so. Why such big differences in fatality numbers, in death rate numbers between India and Europe? One of the factors is the age structure. But another one, which I have become a believer now, tuberculosis, BCG, malaria, these things floating around have given Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, even East Asia. The numbers actually in Indonesia and other countries, if you look at, are pretty close to uh, um, uh, India, have given us a kind of resilience. So we must not play the trade-off between lives and livelihoods by copying Western uh, countries verbatim and trying to do it the same way. Dr. Basu, this has been an education. Thank you very much for giving us a sense of what you believe are the challenges that lie ahead. Always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us here on the news today. Hello everyone, this is Rahul Kamal here. Hope you enjoyed this video. For the latest news and analysis, like and subscribe the India Today YouTube channel and don't forget to press the bell icon to stay updated.